have a really interesting and timely topic that we're delighted to bring to you on how social media disrupts our elections, our economy, and our health. Uh, we're hearing more and more these days about social media and its influences in, in many aspects of our lives. We're joined by our top faculty, uh, Professor Sanan Aral, who's going to lead us through today's webinar. The format for today's webinar is we'll have about 20 minutes of presentation from uh, Sanan, uh, which promises to be very interesting and insightful. I'm sure we can go on for hours, but we have a limited amount of time. So um, with this in mind, if we go to the next slide. At the end, we have 20 minutes of presentation. We'll also have about 10 minutes left at the end for questions and answers. I do hope that you'll submit your questions to the Q&A panel. We'll bring those to Sanan's attention at the end of the program. Uh, I'd like to welcome you, Sanan. Thank you so much for joining us. As I mentioned, you're one of our top faculty here at MIT Sloan. In addition to your role in teaching, you also direct the Innovate an Initiative on the Digital Economy here at MIT. You've got a very important book coming up, The Hype Machine, and you also work closely with a number of companies in this area of, of social media and technology. Uh, what we're going to cover today is we look forward to discussing the future of social media, uh, as you've termed the hype machine, and how it impacts our brains, elections, economy, and our health. So I know you have a great amount uh, that you'd like to cover today. Without any further hesitation, over to you, Simone. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, so thank you to everyone who, uh, who has joined us. It's an honor to be here, even virtually today. We have so many important topics going on in our world, in our society today, uh, and one of those uh, among many uh, that is also intertwined with some of the others is the role of digital technologies in how our society is responding uh, to current events, including uh, the rise of civil justice um, uh, uh, social movements, the COVID pandemic, uh, the upcoming, what is likely to be one of the most consequential elections uh, of our, of the last hundred years in the United States, uh, the world is in turmoil. I think that's an understatement. Uh, and there is a lot of change going on. And a big factor in that change uh, is new media, new digital technologies like social media. Um, you can't almost turn uh, on a radio or a television without hearing something about what's going on with social media today. So from the Facebook boycott, the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, uh, the notion of election interference uh, from Russia and China and Iran in the uh, 2020 upcoming election and how we might protect our democracy from that, the concept of free speech regulation or uh, Section 230 protection from civil liability uh, for the moderation of user-generated content on social media, the spread of hate speech and propaganda on social media, as well as um, front and center questions about antitrust uh, and whether we should break up big tech. Uh, these are all about the future of our democracy, the future of our society. Uh, and um, I have essentially been studying these topics for the last 20 years. Since I arrived at MIT, I've been looking into the role of social media in society. Four years before Facebook was founded, I wrote my PhD dissertation uh, on this topic, and I've been studying it ever since. That 20 years of research combined with about four and a half years of writing has culminated in a book that I've written called The Hype Machine, the cover of which you see here, which is available for pre-order now and will launch this September 15th. Uh, describing all of the research and thinking that I've done over the last 20 years about how we can uh, achieve the promise of social media and avoid the peril. It also covers topics about how uh, institutions, small businesses, large businesses, government organizations, political campaigns uh, can be effective with social media while uh, paying attention to the consequences of their actions on society. Uh, and so the topic of today's talk is about uh, all of these topics. If you'll remember, in 2016, uh, there was a significant amount of evidence that Russia interfered in the last presidential election. 120 million messages 
uh, propaganda messages sent on Facebook, 20 million sent on Instagram, 10 million tweets to 6 million followers on Twitter, and 43 hours of YouTube content uh, that was propagated by Russia alone in the months leading up to the 2016 presidential election. In 2020, we face an aggravated threat. It's not just Russia, but it's also China and Iran. Uh, and it's during a global pandemic and a tremendous amount of civil unrest uh, for the uh, social movement, for uh, social justice in the United States. Um, the tactics have become more sophisticated as is being uh, disclosed by uh, our intelligence agencies. Instead of impersonating U.S. citizens, uh, Russia and others are nudging actual U.S. citizens to spread misinformation and propaganda, which makes it harder to root out. They've moved their servers from Russia to the United States because our intelligence services have less uh, legal capacity to conduct domestic surveillance. Uh, Russia has infiltrated Iran's cyber war department, perhaps to launch attacks through Iran. Uh, and all of this is going on uh, in, in the lead up to what is uh, most likely one of the most consequential elections of the last hundred years in the United States. Uh, just to give you a sense for what these kinds of misinformation campaigns can do, in April 2013, the AP put out this tweet. It said, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama has been injured. This tweet was retweeted 4,000 times in about five minutes and it went viral thereafter. Uh, and this wasn't real news, this was fake news that was propagated by Syrian hackers that had infiltrated the AP uh, news Twitter handle. Uh, so it was a false tweet that was put out by Syrian hackers. Um, and it wasn't just the spread of misinformation. What happened here was that uh, we have trading algorithms systematically designed to pick up on the sentiment that is being expressed on Twitter and to signal trading uh, based on that sentiment. So when they picked up on this sentiment that perhaps the president had been injured or killed in an explosion in the White House, uh, they immediately began selling stocks and that created, uh, that wiped out $140 billion in equity value in a, mil in a matter of minutes. That is from one tweet. Imagine uh, what the potential effects of 126 million messages are on Facebook uh, or uh, subsequent scale on Instagram and Twitter. Right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We have a significant amount of misinformation spreading about COVID-19. It is changing the behavior of people with regard to uh, social distancing, sheltering in, wearing masks. Uh, it has everything to do with the spread of public health crises. But before there was misinformation about COVID-19, uh, we had experience with this in the past. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of misinformation spread about measles and measles vaccines uh, through Facebook, Facebook advertising. Uh, and uh, earned media on Facebook and Twitter and other places, YouTube. Um, and measles in the United States, just to give you a sense, was eradicated in 2000. In 2010, there were 63 cases of measles in the United States. In the first six months of 2019, there were 1,250 cases in the United States. And so vaccine hesitancy has been linked to uh, the rise of measles cases in the United States. And for those of you who don't know, measles is a very deadly disease, very contagious. Um, and, uh, and experts have testified in front of Congress that vaccine hesitancy is uh, in large part responsible uh, for, the, for the resurgence of measles in the U.S. And there are uh, very significant, there have been very significant efforts to spread misinformation about vaccines uh, around the country uh, that are likely related to this vaccine hesitancy. All of these, you know, democratic, economic, and public health consequences are related to what I call the hype machine, the rise of social media uh, around the world. And it really did rise almost overnight. Uh, 10 years ago or so, the majority of us really had only two technologies with which we were digitally communicating, email, well, three, email, phone, and fax. Uh, and then almost overnight, uh, 
many of us, if not most of us, began getting our news, our social information, our uh, information about our friends and family from social media through algorithms that were either moderated or not uh, by social pla platforms that were either regulated or not. Uh, and it essentially enveloped our entire information order in about a decade across the globe. And it has consequences in at least three, these three domains in terms of our democracies, our economies, and our public health. Now, social media is not just a negative consequence. It has the potential for promise and the potential for peril. When Nepal was hit with its largest earthquake in the last hundred years, it devastated the country. Uh, and there were immediate responses to the, uh, to the earthquake. First of all, Facebook, uh, through a program that it has called uh, Safety Check, notified millions and millions of people of the safety of their friends and family in a matter of minutes through text messages uh, that were checking on the safety of Facebook users uh, in, the, uh, in the country. And this delivered what I don't think is an exaggeration to say the largest sigh of relief in human history because it was the uh, first time that uh, fa uh, safety check had been used at this scale in such a short period of time. But then Facebook went to work raising money for relief efforts. Europe donated $3 million, the United States donated $10 million, and Facebook almost overnight donated $15.5 million, more than the, the US and Europe combined, with donations from almost a million people from 175 different countries. It has tremendous uh, ability to mobilize people for social good, uh, and to support social movements and other things like that. Social movements uh, like the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, like the Snow Revolution in Russia, like Tahrir Square and the Arab Spring, uh, have relied on social media to resist uh, um, civil injustice uh, and oppression around the world. In the book I describe in detail what the power and the fragility of these social movements are like. Another great example is uh, almost a uh, sometimes comical example. Uh, people debate whether the ice bucket challenge uh, was just a PR stunt or whether it had real impact, um, but nobody debates that 250 million, a quarter of a billion dollars was raised for ALS in eight weeks. There's also a tremendous amount of economic opportunity. Uh, we have estimated at MIT that Facebook generates um, uh, approximately $370 billion a year in consumer surplus in the United States alone through economic opportunities that are created. Uh, and that's just in the United States. But we've also experienced what I call a COVID-180. Uh, almost a whiplash, because if you remember, before COVID hit, uh, social media was a pariah. There was the Cambridge Analytica scandal, the great hack movie, the delete Facebook movement. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen gave a great speech at the Anti-Defamation League, calling it the greatest propaganda machine in history. And then when COVID hit, we were all sheltered uh, on our laptops and in our homes, and we all went online in record numbers. And we realized in that moment how dependent we are on this technology for our information and our social connection. These uh, platforms broke records during the pandemic. Facebook, uh, Netflix, YouTube, other programs. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg was quoted as saying, we're just trying to keep the lights on over here. And after COVID, uh, you know, today, what we see is the backlash returning. Uh, we see the uh, boycott Facebook movement gaining steam, the stop hate for profit, et cetera. And what this tells us is that we are at a crossroads today, that there is a promise to social media and there is definitely a peril. We're at a crossroads between privacy, free speech, truth, democracy, and connection, social connection on one hand, and insecurity, hate speech, the spread of false news, authoritarianism, and political polarization on the other hand. And the rise of social media is really a consequence of what I call the technology trifecta. The very rapid scaling of digital social networks, 
smartphones and machine intelligence, which routes the information across what I describe in this book as the new central nervous system of humanity. This technology is built, built for our brains. In a whole chapter, I describe the neuroscience of what our brains look like on social media and what's known as the social brain hypothesis, which hypothesis, hypothesizes that human beings aren't the dominant mental species on the planet because of our, uh, because of our um, uh, manipulative dexterity or our logic or reason, but our brains are so big and advanced because of our ability to socialize. There's a lot of evidence that our socialization and our complex social hierarchies and our attempts to keep all of these social signals in our brains are what created uh, Homo sapiens and the advancement of Homo sapien uh, brains over time. Now, when you consider that, uh, what you realize is that tossing, essentially uh, hooking our brains up to a new technology that bombards us with trillions of social signals every day that our brains were uh, evolved to process uh, is like tossing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. Uh, in terms of the stimulation through the do dopamine reward system and other systems, which I describe at length uh, in a full chapter in the book. I also have a full chapter about the economics of the technology and how it hooks us economically through the concept of network effects and uh, making it very difficult to um, imagine a world without social media. That combined with the design of the technology to lock us into walled gardens where all of our historical family and friend photos and pictures and memories are tied to our Instagram posts and our Facebook posts and our tweets. Again, it makes it very difficult to imagine a world where we give up social media easily. The way that it influences our behavior and the way our behavior influences it is described in the book as a complex interplay of machine intelligence and human behavior through what I call the hype loop, which describes in detail the hype machine under the hood, how the technology interface, interfaces with our brains and how that uh, directs our behaviors and in turn directs our uh, society and our, um, and our uh, democracies, our economies and our public health. In the book, I describe this technology trifecta in the middle, digital social networks, smartphones, and machine intelligence as creating three trends in society, personalized mass persuasion, hyper-socialization, and an attention economy which generates a tyranny of trends. I also describe the four levers at our disposal for uh, achieving the promise of social media while avoiding the peril, and that is the money, code, norms, and laws, money being the incentives created by the business models, code being the de design of the algorithms and the technology, the norms being how we as a society use the technology and the norms we develop around how we express our speech on these platforms, and of course the laws, how we regulate free speech and hate, hate speech, how we regulate uh, protection from civil liability in the Communications Decency Act of 1996, and how we uh, conduct regulation around antitrust. Obviously, uh, the social media platforms are under a lot of regulatory scrutiny. There are big calls to break up big tech. Uh, I take a very firm position on whether or not we should break up big tech in this book and I go into great detail to defend that position. I also describe uh, privacy laws and how uh, we can expect to protect our privacy in the new social age, talking about GDPR in Europe and uh, the new California privacy law that went into effect in January, what that means for our businesses, uh, our society, and our own individual privacy. I've also written extensively about how we can protect our elections from social media manipulation and how we can harden our democracy uh, to the threat of social media manipulation. Um, 
And we have written about this, for instance, this is an article we wrote in Science uh, about protecting our elections from social media manipulation. All of that is also covered in the book. And the main message of the book is very simple. And that is that we can achieve the promise of social media while avoiding the peril. But to do so, we have to be rigorous and analytical. We have to approach it in a scientific way rather than in a soundbite way or a political slogan way or in a polarized uh, political approach. Uh, the Hype Machine is a book, 20 years in the making, that describes how we must adapt as a world uh, to this new incredibly consequential uh, technology. So the Hype Machine uh, comes out September 15th um, in, pa in uh, paper form and in, in hardback. Uh, it's available for, for pre-order now from all of uh, your typical outlets. And with that, I'll stop a few seconds early so that we can have a little bit more time for questions. And I really appreciate all of you for, for coming and uh, look forward to more conversation now and in the future. So thank you. Sanan, thank you. What, what a great presentation really gives us a lot to think about. And it sounds like your book will be a wonderful resource that will really go into detail on a lot, a lot of the issues that we just touched base briefly with today. Um, one question that I, I've seen in the thread and comes to mind very quickly, what advice do you have for everybody in the audience today on how people or individuals can protect themselves from social media manipulation? So uh, two or three things immediately come to mind. One is that it is, and these are sort of the low hanging fruit. I have uh, many structural recommendations how we as a society and a government can deal with this problem, but low hanging fruit that you can implement today uh, one, it is incredibly easy to fact check the largest 80% of the fake news that exists out there in the world. Simple Google searches, simple searches for uh, um, fact checking online, which is uh, extensive now from many different organizations, uh, will tell you the extent to which different memes that you see online are true or false. And I highly recommend doing that prior to sharing or believing any of this information. I frequently see people share this and say, oh, I don't know if it's true, if this is true, but it's kind of interesting and worth thinking about uh, a quick fact check to know whether it is true or not before saying something like that can go a long way. Another very easy thing is to, uh, is to educate ourselves. So I have a seven-year-old son, uh, and I uh, you know, think that even he, in his classroom, uh, can be told by a first or second grade teacher a two or three-step process for thinking critically about what you're told and just remember to always ask questions. Don't just believe everything you see. Uh, this is just a precursor low-hanging fruit to what could be a much broader and more systematic uh, digital media literacy programs in our schools and elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, specific question on your insights on how social media is changing healthcare. Any thoughts there? Yes. So it is, there's no question that we get a lot of our information about healthcare online today. Uh, certainly through Google searches, but more and more through Facebook, Facebook groups, uh, and other types of social media. So uh, it certainly is just as, more, as much a big part of engaging with patients as it is small and medium-sized and large enterprises engaging with consumers. And if that's true, then uh, healthcare and public health organizations have to take the information that's spreading on social media seriously engage themselves in those conversations and uh, try to reset misinformation, try to put out um, uh, true information and try to make sure that everyone is properly informed and to engage with questions uh, in detail. Great, I've had a, a, a few questions come in around AI and machine, and machine learning, um, some related to how the, the brain functions, is, is, but is, do you see AI and machine learning as hype, enabler, or threat is the question? Uh, I think it's both. So I think it, uh, AI and machine learning, there is no doubt that uh, machine learning 
And AI is a, is a broad term. So general artificial intelligence is years away. Uh, there are a number of different things that need to be addressed in AI research to really get to you know, the science fiction of general artificial intelligence, but it certainly is possible. Uh, machine learning is a technology that's existed for years. Uh, neural networks is a technology that's existed for at least four decades and has now become powerful due to the processing power and storage of large scale data that is required to do it effectively. These technologies are very real, very powerful, and very influential. So it's not hype. Uh, I do uh, cover in depth the uh, symbiotic role of human intelligence and machine intelligence and how that drives outcomes uh, in the book, business outcomes, societal outcomes, democratic outcomes, health outcomes. Uh, and I think that taking seriously recommendation engines, both for content and for people to follow, as well as other types of algorithms that are almost fully responsible for curating what information we see from the news that we see, the people we're recommended to follow, even who we're recommended to date in dating apps is driven by these algorithms. All of that is covered in detail in the book. I do think it's a very, very important and influential uh, topic in society today. And we probably have time for one or two more questions. My apologies if we're not able to get to all the questions. We have quite a few coming in. But uh, your thoughts and comments on regulation around the world. We had one question about how social media is being regulated on the African content. But either of other parts of the world with different regulations, what do you see in terms of trends or issues in regulation? Well, first of all, I cover uh, regulation on the African continent in the book. I go through a couple of uh, uh, specific case studies of countries and what they've tried to do in regulating social media. I would describe African regulation of social media as being a broadsword right now, not a scalpel. Large across the board taxes on social media, which has uh, consequences that increase inequality. It because uh, so many small and medium-sized businesses in Africa depend on social media as their tool to engage new consumers and to be online. Uh, and so I cover that extensively in the book. In addition, I think the general trends are one, the uh, regulation of speech uh, on uh, social media is taking center stage in Europe, in China, and in the United States. Two, the regulation of privacy what's done with data. We have essentially three regimes around the world right now. China, which is essentially a, a surveillance state. Europe, which uh, leans very heavily towards privacy. Uh, and the United States, which is trying to figure out what it's doing. California and a patchwork of other states have laws and we're likely to see a federal privacy legislation in the next 18 to 24 months. I cover all of that in the book as well. And then finally, antitrust. So is Facebook a monopoly? Should it be broken up? Uh, is that going to solve problems of the spread of fake news and misinformation, privacy, and the spread of hate speech and propaganda online? All of that is also covered in the book. I see those as the major policy questions. Great. Thank you. And the book again comes out on September 15th. We'll look forward to that. Uh, Sanam, we are out of time. I want to thank you. If you could just advance to the next slide. I think you want to point out uh, a few things. Upcoming programs, if you're interested in learning more, Sanan teaches in our executive education programs. Here's just a few that you may want to consider if you'd like to hear more from Sanan on these topics. Uh, again, Sanan, thank you for your time and for all that you do for executive education. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us and encourage you to uh, tune in for our next program, our next webinar next week, which I believe is with Bill Owlett. Uh, I'd like to thank the MIT team that supported today's program, the ZECAD team, and we'll look forward to seeing you all online again. Thank you. Thank you.